It looks absolutely tremendous to me, and I can't wait to eat Mike's <laughs> dinner steak here. <laughs> He's back there giving us the finger, guys. This is the Meet America podcast, presented by Code 3 Spices, produced by Red Meat Lover. And now your host, Joey and Mike. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Meet America podcast presented by Code 3 Spices and sponsored by Grill Great at grillgrate.com and they can be found at retailers across the country. Another sponsor, Ardent Spirits. Today we are filming once again at Old Herald Distillery here in Collinsville. My name is Joe Lampy. You may know me better as Joey Brisket, but I am the Chief Beef Officer at RedMeatLover.com and Red Meat Lover on YouTube. Now, before I introduce my co-host, I just want to mention for anyone who's listening today, you can always find the audio. This is an audio a visual podcast. You can always find the visual on our YouTube channel at Red Meat Lover. Now, I will want to introduce the Sultans of Spice, the Maestros of Meat, uh, my co-host, Mike Radosovich of Code 3 Spices and Code 3 Barbecue Supply. What's up, homie? What's up, Joe? How you doing? Good. We just, uh, just had a, some uh, tacos from Birch Chuck Wagon. What do you, what do you think about those tacos? It's, uh, you know, it's like a step back in time over there, I know. Man. It's good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we got Chris here today, my business partner. Um, he is coming off a fresh golden ticket win from his last state cook-off association event. So congratulations to Chris. Thank you, guys. Uh, where was that? Uh, Eureka, Illinois. Up by Peoria? Up by Peoria, about a half hour from Peoria. And there was a close to 30 teams? Yeah, I think 28 was the number. So when we were filming up in Chicago, he was winning a, a golden ticket already this year. Well, congratulations, and I think that's a great place to start. Now, there might be many people who are listening who uh, understand what the initials SCA stand for, but uh, can one of you gentlemen uh, fill in our audience, listeners at home, what is SCA? SCA is the State Cook-Off Association. Um, they have about 300 events a year, um, which now are worldwide. So Australia, Japan, the Netherlands, um, almost a lot of the countries have them. And so tell us a little bit more about what that event is. So a steak cook-off uh, is essentially a one-day event. Um, there could be doubles, there could be triples where you cook multiple events in a day or a weekend. Um, it's a one day event. You show up, you cook a steak, you get judged and you go home either happy or sad. Well, it sounds like a great time. Uh, what kind of steak are they cooking? So you, the, the regulations in the state cook off association is a one and one eighth inch choice grade ribeye. All right. And then how do you, do you bring in your own ribeyes or tell us a little bit more about so, that, that process the day uh, of the competition? So the, the ribeyes are actually provided by the organizer, um, whether they're donated or they purchase them. Um, the idea behind that is it puts everybody on a level playing field. So you're not going to be able to bring in a Wagyu or a prime or um, actually if you have steaks in your cooler, the day of the event, they will come by your booth and cut them in half. So they can make sure that you cannot put anything else into the game. Absolutely. Um, the integrity of yeah. the uh, competition. Yeah. And there's, and, and it's not very often that somebody has them, but if they do, it's probably because they're making dinner, you know, it's not the intention to cheat, but, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you come in, you select your steaks, you cook and, you, you, when the dust settles, whoever's at the top wins. Yeah. Now, if I did, if I did spend the money to purchase a Wagyu ribeye, I'd be pretty upset that someone just cut that thing in half. But <laughs> <laughs> as an aside, tell us a little bit about. So they provide the steaks. Uh, how's how do people go through and and uh, and choose the steak? Is it first come first serve, or how does that process work? So they actually have a a bag that you pull a number out of. So there'll be a number for each team. Um, Actually, sometimes there's more than enough for the teams. You pull a number and you do a NFL style draft, whatever. If you pull number one and there's 30 teams, you're going to pick first and you're going to pick 30th or I'm sorry, 60th because it's two stakes. So you'll go through the line as the first guy. And then after everybody else picks, you pick last. Um, that's a way to keep it fair. All the stakes are laid on a table. Uh, the only person that's allowed to touch them is the organizer on the other side of the table. Um, so nobody's picking them up. Nobody's moving them. Um, so the organizer can flip them over if you ask. 
Um, they will place them in your pan or in your bag. Um, and then you take two steaks back to your cooking spot and start the trimming process, get to work. And why two steaks? Uh, you can go either way. They do two steaks. One is a practice steak. Um, every place we've gone, it's been a different, your, your practice steak is always different than the last time you cooked. Kind of gets you in the groove, gets you going with the idea of, you know, maybe I need to make adjustments to time. Um, you can take that practice steak, cut it open after you cook it, see where it ended up. Um, you know, keep an eye on your grill marks, that kind of stuff. And then, uh, make the adjustments to taste too. Yeah. Yeah. You can make adjustments to taste. If you, if you take a bite and it's bland and you need to add salt, add that into your rub and get it ready to go. And then the second one's for real. It, so I want to talk a little bit more about selecting a steak, but before I do, when you, you're, so we get, we get that you're picking out two steaks. One's a practice steak. One's the turn in steak. Are you making that decision after you've cooked both of them? Or it sounds like you're actually cooking one, trying it out. And then, then the second one is going to be your turn in steak. Is that the right process or the, People do it both ways. Um, some guys, I usually make my decision after I trim my steaks. When I get them trimmed, get them ready to go hit the grill is when I make my decision on which one's going to be my turn in steak. Um, some guys will actually trim both steaks, season them, cook them both, and then decide which one they're going to turn in. Um, I would prefer to, you know, make adjustments if that steak's a little thinner than, than it normally is or a lot of these steaks are hand cut, so you can't guarantee that it's going to be one and one eighth inch. Um, you know, your fire may be a little hot, hotter than normal, so it cooks a little faster. You have to adjust your times. Um, so I prefer to take the practice steak and actually cut it open and use it as practice, which does not bode well if you mess up the turn in steak. No, I can only imagine the pressure that's on on that second cook. Yeah, you have to get it right, but you should have made your adjustments and you'll know what right is at that point. Well, I'm asking a lot of questions. I've never competed in one of these events. Thanks to both of you gentlemen, I got one of the greatest pleasures of my entire life when I was able to serve as a judge in uh, a steak cook-off event. And it was truly, I mean, to have 30 terrifically cooked, mostly terrifically cooked uh, <laughs> ribeyes passing in front of you. And of course, you know, I think as any uh, meatitarian out there would attest, I mean, uh, being uh, being a judge in a steak competition was definitely a bucket list item for me. So I want to thank you both for that opportunity that you guys gave me at your annual event, Code 3 Spices, Smoking on Main. Big, just want to give it a plug now. I know it, it, we got, uh, it got shut down this year because of what I called that Kofifi or that Viri it goes by a lot of different names, but it got shut down this year, but it's a big event you guys host every single year, right? Bring, I'll let you take it from here. Tell us more about it. Well, this would have been our fourth year. Yeah. Uh, we had to pass this year. Uh, the first year Chris and I did it. We really didn't know what to expect. We learned a lot from that. Second year was really big. Third year was very big. Um, I think the city estimated 50,000 in attendance. The last one we had a uh, very large scale economic impact for our community, which was nice. And honestly, it's something that Chris really takes the lead on. And we both just love being a part of it because it allows us to give back to the community that's supporting us already. Um, you know, but at the end of the day, it allows us to give money back to the local food pantry here in Collinsville, Illinois and the U.S. Veterans Foundation. But we're working on something now. We can't talk about it right yet, but uh, Chris is working on something literally right now in the works for uh, the end of the year. So keep your ears open for that. Uh, absolutely. And before we uh, get back to Steak Cook-Off, I just want to take a moment and pat you both on the back because I noticed you did not acknowledge it, but you don't. And it was I was very surprised to hear this because I've, I've been to this event. I know how much work goes into it. You donate all your profits back, correct? Yeah, all of it. That's incredible. So I just want to acknowledge you both uh, for not only what you do for the barbecue community, but what you do for your local community as well. We're always going to hear in life, especially as business owners, uh, husbands, um, when you mess up, right? That's always going to be front and center in our lives. You don't always hear about uh, the good that you're doing. So I wanted to make sure our audience knows um, what uh, what you guys are doing for the community. And well, again, I appreciate the, uh, the attention on that. But, here, you know, honestly, and Chris, you can chime in if you want, but we're so enthralled in every day is filled with Code 3 and what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we stay pretty busy. We don't really get a lot of time to 
sit back and see everything that we're doing or accomplishing, but we just love doing it. This is what we do for a living, you know, so uh, we try to bring the community into everything that we do, even if we're coming out with a new product, which we have one right here. We have people help pick out the names. We have, you know, people come into our barbecue supply, give it some taste test, if you will. That way, Chris can go back to the drawing board. So um, bar we've talked about this before, barbecues community, and we just like doing the right thing. So that's sort of that in a nutshell. Absolutely. Very well said. We do have some uh, incredible uh, spices and seasonings on the table in front of us. We're going to get into those in just a minute as we uh, dig more into the SCA event itself. And that's where I kind of want to jump off into our next question. Chris, you talked about you don't select your turn in uh, ribeye until after it's trimmed. Why is that? Well, I, you can look at a steak, you can, you know, look at the spinalis and the loin and you can say, Hey, I think that'll trim up nice. But until you actually get it trimmed to where it needs to be competition style, um, you're not a hundred percent sure what it's going to look like. I've had a lot of times where I picked a steak and I was like, well, the other one's not going to matter because this is the one I'm going with. And by the time I trim, you know, the spinalis down and I trim the tail and all of that, and I was, well, now I like this one more. So you really don't know until you get them trimmed. So I go through, trim both of them, make my decision. And then that's when I see, I, I actually take a piece of string in a half pan and I put it right in front of the one I'm turning in. So that way, no matter what happens, I know that's the turn in stake. The other one just sits there for practice. And so uh, even stepping back further than that, let's go back to the steak uh, selection, you know, the mm -hmm. lottery, um, one through 30, then 30 through 60. What are you looking for? Uh, what is a great looking steak or what are some qualities that you're looking for as you as you go through the selection process? Uh, some of the easiest things to to be on the lookout for is to make sure that the steaks are even from side to side. Um, because you're judged on doneness when they cut it through the middle. Um, if one side's thinner than the other, one side's obviously going to get more done. And depending on where the judge looks, that could cost you points. Um, I also make sure I look for a good spinalis because that's where the judges are, are tasting from. Um, and then I look in my mind what it would look like when I round off the bottom of the loin portion, which is becoming the appearance. So the five categories you're judged on are uh, doneness, appearance, taste, tenderness, and overall impression. So taste is going to be your rubs and your butter or whatever you decide, your duck fat spray, whatever you decide to use. Um, your two things that you can really control are your appearance and your doneness. If you hit the right temperature and you hit the right grill marks, as long as it was trimmed correctly, you're now up in, in the running. Um you know, the overall impression, that's a very subjective category. The taste is very subjective. Um, and then tenderness, you, you have to figure out what the judges are looking for. I mean, my tenderness scores have been all over the board. Sometimes it's correct. Sometimes it's wrong. And I don't know what the difference is. Um, but it also, it also comes down to the judge that's sitting at the table, whether they like the tenderness. It's not, is it tender or is it not tender? It's, is it the correct tenderness for you? which is what makes it so subjective. So as long as you control the couple of things that you can control, you get those right, the rest should fall into place. Beautiful. And I just want to tease a little bit here. I, you brought a ribeye steak with you here today, right? Oh, we do have one. Awesome. And you're going to show us how to trim it up, kind of we're going to walk through some of this in a visual format, and then you're going to cook for us today, yeah. right? Yeah, we'll do a, we'll cook up a steak today. We'll, uh, we'll give you some, some tips and tricks for, um, either getting into your first competition or even for just cooking in your backyard. Um, I use these same, same recipes at home, um, that I cook here. So yeah, we'll have, uh, we'll have a little fun firing up the grill grates and seeing what we can turn out. Well, I, I love it. Um, before we jump back there, can you talk to us a little bit more about what it's like at the competition itself? So you've selected your steak. I mean, there's 30, guys out there with uh, grills i i've i know enough we've talked to enough barbecue comp uh, competition pit masters to know that these those events are usually a lot of fun filled with uh you know some adult beverages um good music so what's the can you give us like the essence of an event after you select your steak what's the ambiance like and uh the overall uh feeling of being at one of these events it really comes down to the uh to the event itself some of these are open to the public some of them are not um some of them are just a straight up competition um you roll in in the morning usually you have a cook's meeting at 10 a.m 
So you get there in the morning, you set up your tent and your grill, um, you know, your cooking station, however you like to set it up. Um, and then you have a cook's meeting at 10. They go over the rules and the sponsors and you do a steak selection. Um, by 1030, you're back in your booth. Uh, you trim your steaks and depends on turn in time. You know, I like to start my grill an hour and a half before I actually cook on it. So I can get that, that temperature even throughout. Um, so once you get your steaks trimmed, usually <laughs> you sit for two hours. There's nothing to do. You just wait. Um, and a lot of the guys, you know, you talk about John Lindsay and, and Scott Lindley and all those guys, um, you know, we all walk around and talk and hang out and it's a great day um until you get to that hour and a half before turn ins and, and this is the other thing too so like everybody listening and watching <clears throat> these these guys are literally the best in the entire world at state cook off you know so to to get a golden ticket that that's a big deal you're he just mentioned a couple names and there's a lot of great guys and gals all over oh, this yeah. country um that know what they're doing when it comes to uh SCA state cookoffs. But uh I think one thing that we could probably interlude with right now is just go over and I'm gonna let Chris Chris is really good about uh breaking down flavor profiles and whatnot. So we're just gonna go through a list real here, real quick here. Um we're gonna start off with that one, Chris, the grunt rub, if you want to grab that real quick. Um Wizard, you wanna get a shot of this stuff? And Chris, just let's go ahead and start going through the line here. We'll actually do duck fat. Let's just do that duck fat first and talk a little bit about the product, what it's used for, what you use it for. Explore the methods and recipes for cooking meat in restaurants across America as we showcase experts on location in their restaurant kitchens to educate, inspire, and entertain. Tune into our travel cooking show, Meet America, only on YouTube and redmeatlover.com. Yeah, so duck fat... Uh this is a, a newer product to the market. It's the first time I've ever seen it in an actual aerosol can, um, which is fantastic. They, um, the guy that came out, he came out of Omaha, Nebraska is where it's from. Um, and it's a fantastic product. What I like to do with it, um, besides use it as a cooking oil, I use it on my Blackstone griddle, that kind of stuff. But at an SCA specifically, right before I put my steak on, well, let me back up. About five minutes before I put my steak on, I'll spray my grill grates, um, make sure that they become a nonstick surface, kind of bake it in a little bit. And then I'll spray the actual face of my steak with the duck fat. Helps for awesome sear marks. It has a high burn point, so it doesn't turn black as fast. Um, and it just, it, it it's a fantastic, I can't say enough about it. We move a lot of that at our shop. And so what is it about that product compared to, let's say, avocado oil? What sets it apart? I think that a lot of it's the burn point. I think duck fat, if I remember correctly, it's like 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. And there's some other oils, olive oil, avocado that you could use. Um, but they go to a burn point earlier, which means they start to smoke and, and they turn black and they'll turn the face of your steak black too. Um, so and burn steak is bitter steak, right? right. <laughs> yeah. That's, and that's exactly what you worry about. It becomes, it becomes acrid. Um, and this, it has an acidic flavor to it, and it's not good. Um, and that's, again, back to your your taste, your overall impression, that's part of the deal. And so, you know, we've talked to, I hear a lot of opinions out there about, do I oil the grate? Do I oil the steak? Even with something that's really fatty like a ribeye, um, you're taking and you're oiling both, if I heard you right, the grates mm -hmm. and the steak. Yeah, some guys, what they'll do is they'll actually cut the tail off of the ribeye. It's that, that fat section. Um, and they'll actually use that to run across their grill grates as a, as a form of grease. Um, I just like that. I have a spray can and I don't have to worry about, you know, doing it any other way. It's a hot item right now. I mean, we, he does the majority of the ordering for, um, co three barbecue supply.com. And we make announcement that we just got it back in the store and it's flying off the shelves. It's, it's a tremendous product. Nice guy too. That owns it. real nice guy. Yeah. Seen that all over the interwebs right now. Um, so what's next? You got it so, sprayed down and then what? Yeah. So, I actually, the way we have these rubs set up, I set them in two different directions. Um, what we like to do is a salt, pepper, garlic base. Um, there's tons of products out there. There's, you know, the Code 3 Grunt Rub. Um, we like to get that. We actually powdered it up a little bit um, because of back to texture, a bigger grind judges don't like. Um, 
but we also have, you know, Killer Hogs AP seasoning. We got um, John Lindsay I was talking about earlier is all queued up steak shake. Um, these are these are just base layers, you know, Boar's Night Out, White Lightning. Um, all of those make an excellent base layer. Um, and it comes down to personal preference. Um, there's other ones out there. I know Fergalicious has an SPG. Um, they're all about the same. Um, comes down to flavor profiles. So you're talking about base flavor. So it kind of implies that you're layering something on top of that base, right? Yeah, yeah. So we don't, you can either layer or you can pre-blend. Um, you know, you can make your own stuff at home that you like. There's just so many out there, you know, so many commercially available rubs that it got to the point where it doesn't make sense to make them anymore. Everything that's on this table right now, I mean, people are taking first place with. Yeah. You know, so it's not one specific rub. You know, I, I do a lot of uh, steak cooking just in my backyard because my, my kids love steak. And I've used all these and I've paired them all differently, too. Um, you know, recently what I've been doing is I've really been salt and peppering the, the sides of the steak as well. You know, I, I haven't been to an SCA in about a year. Um, but I mean, is that sort of a standard thing now? I mean, are you seeing a lot of guys go ahead and hitting those sides? Uh, yeah. I mean, you don't have to, it, the only side you're really worried about hitting is the spinalis because right. that's where the taste comes from. Um, they don't really see the sides of anything else for appearance or anything like that. So, you know, as long as you have a decent color on it, um, like I'll, when I season my steak, whatever seasoning's left on the cutting board, I'll just kind of roll my steak through it, just trying to get some flavor on it. But you do want that spinalis that needs to have flavor because that's where they're going to take their bite from. Well, and you know a lot about winning because you talked about golden tickets. You now have won three of them. Is correct. that correct? So That's right. It's, uh, you're usually in a the, the competition pool, as you said, normally about 30 pe- teams. Is mm-hmm. that correct? Yeah, 30 to 40, depending on where. I mean, we went down to uh, the shed in Mississippi, and it was, uh, if I remember right, it was 190 teams. There's a lot, man. There's a lot. 190 teams, and it was a double. So we did two state competitions in the same day. And uh, when the dust settled, I got lucky, and I took a sixth and a 15th, I think. Yeah, but let me cut you off, dude. So – you know, all the big names in the barbecue industry when it comes to, I don't care if it's, you know, a, a weekend competition or Memphis May or whatever it is, or just a single stake event or even a double, you know, these guys and gals that are winning first place trophies, you know, granted, Chris and I do this for a living. We talk barbecue every single day of our life. Um, a lot of these guys don't, but the one thing that separates them from everybody else is we've talked about it in the past, attention to detail. Um, Chris is a very analytical guy. So I, I knew when he got into this, that he was going to be really good at this, but these people practice almost daily. Yeah. Oh yeah. Daily. They're, they're the best in the world. You know, um, we don't do a lot of steak cooking at our shop right now, but if he's got an event coming up, you know, he'll bring some ribeyes in and, you know, have some buddies in to try some, uh, new flavor profiles or new techniques or whatever. But there's a lot of work that goes into a steak. People, a lot, of, a lot of people come into the shop and they're like, oh, I can make the perfect steak. And well, that's great. There's a big difference between a, a backyard perfect steak and a golden ticket perfect steak. There is. There's there, a big difference. Yeah. It, it, and I don't mean to I don't mean to say this like, you know, there's nothing to it. You just season it up and cook it. I mean, there is a lot of work. And and the guys that are, you know, Sandy Brown and Tim Brown are Sandy's leading the points chase right now. Uh, Tim, I think is in the, he's in top 10, five, six, maybe. Yeah. I mean, those guys are, they leave on a Thursday from their house and they'll hit a comp in, uh, where'd she go last time? Eureka, Illinois. The next morning they drove overnight to Tulsa, Oklahoma and did a double there and then went somewhere else on Sunday and cooked yeah. another one there and then drove home. Wow. So it's not busy schedule. Yeah. This is not, it's not something where you just wake up, cook a steak and you're done. Um, there's a lot of, you know, traveling, um, there's a lot of planning that goes into this process. Um, and the biggest key to it is, you know, make sure you're consistent. You know, if you're hitting and you're consistent, you're going to continue hitting. And, and let me touch on this too, real quick. So, you know, I was a baseball player and I used to sit in the dugout and visualize when the pitcher was taking his warms up. So I just visualized my swing, hitting the ball. If he was throwing a lot of off speed pitches that day, I'd visualize hitting it to right field it's the same mindset for all these professional pit masters as well. Cause I mean, you've got to mindset and visualize, go over your planning. Um, 
you know, like he said, I'm going to go ahead and put my twine in front of that one. It, it's all these little things that add up to being a person who gets a golden ticket. As, and, as Smoking Tin Man would say, plan your work and work your plan. Yeah. Yeah. And he's right. He's right. Well, you, you just talked about some people who are traveling from multiple events. You talked about a leaderboard, talked about golden tickets. That's what happens when you win an event. Why does someone need to win or why do they compete more than once if they've already won the golden ticket? Isn't that their, already their entry? So there, the- well, there's two things. Uh, number one, there is a points race. Um, there is a top 10 in the U.S. Okay. Um, I believe there's top 10 in the U.S. and then top 10 abroad. Um, those top 10 people automatically get entry into the SCA championship, if I remember correctly. Um, and I can't remember if it's the top 10 or the top, the overall winner gets access straight to Sunday to the world championship. I thought it was overall. It could be. Um, but we, I, we can talk about that process if you want the world championship, which is a little different. Um, but then there's also prize money. Most of these comps, first place pays $1,000. Um, and when you're traveling like Tim and Sandy, you got to be making some money along the way or this right. gets expensive real quick. Yeah, and so you talked about, you know, I mean, there's always that just uh, a fire for winning, right, to compete in anything, no matter what it is. The, yep. the money uh, definitely adds a, a little a carrot, if you will, and then the recognition, the ability to go on and compete at the uh, world stage. Uh, one thing that uh, I noticed uh, when I was a, a – participated as a judge in your event was that there's often another protein that's cooked. You guys uh, did an ancillary competition for pork steaks, which is a largely Midwestern Mm -hmm. regional cut uh, steak cut from the pork shoulder. And, um, you know, growing up in St. Louis, I had, I have cooked and eaten these things, you know, my entire life. And it wasn't until that competition that I realized I'd been cooking them all wrong because there were some (laughs) real good ones turned in. So, I mean, dude, there's an art to the pork, perfect pork steak. There really is. There really is. And there's different ways to do it too. You know, we all grew up on pretty much uh, direct flame grilled pork ha- steaks. Hammer it on the fire and hammer the sauce on Real it. gummy, uh, you know, all that. But And they can turn out, I mean, we've all been to that backyard barbecue. The guy's real proud of it. Lathers this thing up in uh, barbecue sauce and it, it just comes out bitter and burnt end to end. Um, so we've all had them cooked wrong a lot. Um, but what are some of the other proteins you're seeing as ancillary events outside of steak? We've... D- I- I don't do a lot of ancillaries because I find it takes you away from that steak yeah. process. Um, but I know last weekend was uh, anything with bacon. Um, I've seen anything on a stick. I've seen, uh, uh, what was the other one? There was somewhere recently that did oysters. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Louisville. Uh, the one that was supposed to be in Louisville, Kentucky was going to be anything with bourbon in it. <laughs> That yeah, makes that sense. Yeah. And, and, you know, just for everyone listening at home, too, uh, I want to point out that you don't really have to be an expert to compete in one of these things and win. As a matter of fact, the gentleman who won. <laughs> I, I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, well, the gentleman who won your event at the last Smoking on Main, it was the first time he'd ever competed in an event. And so I thought that that was uh, pretty, pretty neat. Yeah, the last couple of years out of all the events I've done, I've, I've seen two or three times that the guy that won, it was his first time ever out the door. And it, I mean, that that has blessings and sure it does. And, and problems associated with it, because then you think you're always going to win and that doesn't happen. So the next time you go out and you take a butt whoop and, you know, you realize, hey, I, I may have just gotten one that first time. Right. There's more to come. But, you know, it, it's 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 a blessing in disguise. You know, you get to go to the championship and that's awesome. I mean, I I felt the same way when I won one. You know, it's it was like, wow, man, this is really good. And then I went up to Iowa a couple of weeks ago and just got my butt handed to yeah. me. So. You know, it, it, it's cool to see these guys win, you know, and, and when Mike Mulkey won his, I mean, I've never seen somebody so excited, um, which was cool because that meant there yeah. were how many people we'd take six, seven. Yeah. Just from our area mm-hmm. went down to the world championship. Well, I'm really excited to watch, you know, the tricks of the trade occur in real time in that kitchen. But before we go back there, can you just take us a little bit from the local event to the world championship stage? What's that experience uh, like and all about? Yeah, the World Championships is uh, is an absolute blast. Uh, Ken and Brett put on such a fantastic event um, for SCA. You know, we I left here on a Thursday, um, drove down to Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, Friday night they have a welcoming party for all the all the contestants, um, and then Saturday it's time to get to work. 
So Saturday, what they do is you, you actually pick a number, which is associated also with your color. There are six groups that are split between 300, let's say 300 contestants. Um, so there's 50 people in each group. You have to finish in the top 10 in your group. If you finish in the top 10 in your group, you then move on to Sunday, which is the world championship. It's the top 60 cooks plus whichever ones automatically qualify. It, it may just be number one overall in the points chase. Um, so 61 or uh, 63 because Europe and Asia points winners are also in there. So it's the top 63 cooks in the country. And then after that, you, you compete again and wherever it shakes out. Um, I finished 12th in the world last year. Congrats. Um, I'm Very looking cool. to hopefully move up. Now that, that helps sales. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that helps sales a lot. Uh, now that, I mean, when I went down there, I went down there with the expectation of, I want to finish in the top 25%, you know, in my, in my group. So the top 15, uh, I think I finished ninth. Um, so the next day my goal was, I want to finish in the top 25%, which was top 15 and I finished 12th. So I, I hit my goals that I wanted. I would not have been shocked with who I was cooking against had I, if I didn't get in that goal. But um, yeah, I mean, you're talking the top 63 in the world and you're competing against them and it just, however it shakes out. Uh, before we get you uh, talking about the ribeye that we brought and seasoning and everything, I want to run through these last four that we have on the table. Sure. So the next one we have is our new one, Top Gun Rub, uh, everything blend. You know, I, when we first started messing with this, I, it was originally designed for chicken. Um, mm -hmm. But dude, I mean, immediately it was like, oh my God, this is perfect on steak. <laughs> yeah. You know? you know, the funny part is I haven't found, there's a reason we called it everything blend. I mean, I've everything from brisket to steak to shrimp, to, I haven't found anything it's bad on. And then this was, um, this is a good buddy of ours. He's got how many, Chris? Four? He's got three, three world champions. 2008 world champion. 14, 16, 15. Uh, Johnny oh, Joseph the Steak Rub. Um, awesome guy, by the way, for everybody listening or watching. But that's a great blend, too. I've used that many times. Uh, Chris, you want to, I mean, this is a basic steak rub from a Malcolm Reed Killer Hogs barbecue. How to barbecue right. Um, that's a lot like our, the coarseness on that's a lot like our grunt rub garlic blend. And if I had to take an educated guess, I'm sure Malcolm grinds his down when he competes as well. Yeah. I, for the people at home, I mean, it, an $8 coffee grinder from a, you know, a Walmart or something does wonders to mess with these rubs. You can change the actual flavor profile. Um, you know, when you grind them, it, it may be that the peppercorns now come out more than the garlic did or, you know, along those lines, it, it, you can change the actual flavor of the rub from what it was initially built as. <laughs> And then this last one here is uh, from Paul Blob. It's a uh, smoking ghost barbecue. He's out of this is a steak and brisket rub out of Chicago. Um, mm, he's actually out of Peoria. Oh, Peoria. Okay, so yeah. I thought he was Chicago. Um, but White Lightning, all queued up. How to barbecue right, and then Code Three. You can anybody listening. You can go to Code Three Barbecue Supply dot com, and we carry all these in house, including the duck fat. So if anybody's listening that might want to try a couple pairings, feel free to send us a message before you order or whatever, and we'll sort of line you up with that. But I'm excited for uh, Chris to show everybody, you know, about the ribeye, how to break it down, how to season, how to cook. Yeah, and uh, uh, we're gonna jump back there. I think earlier I said Chris brought the ribeye, but I want to be clear: Mike brought the ribeye <laughs> that I thought was gonna. Get it was supposed today. to be his dinner, so thank you, Mike, <laughs> hey, uh, for welcome. turning over your ribeye. Yeah, yeah, no least, problem. At uh, least for the people. At least you'll know you'll have a well cooked ribeye tonight. Yeah, he's yeah. Do, just so you guys know, he's doing this for you guys yeah. at home. <laughs> Sixteen dollars a pound. Um, now I will do my very best uh, to walk everyone listening through the process and provide as much feedback as I can, but ultimately. Ultimately, uh, if a picture is worth a thousand words, what's a video worth? If you're listening to this in your car, you can head on over to uh, the visual home of the podcast on YouTube, Red Meat Lover. Go, just go to YouTube, plug in Red Meat Lover, and you'll be able to see exactly what we're doing step by step. So, Chris, let's jump on back to the kitchen. Let's go do it. All right, everyone. So we're back here in the kitchen of Old Herald Distillery where we have this. Uh, well, first of all, we're talking steak cook-off association events. Here we have a beautiful ribeye. Take a look at that. It comes to us from Cordy Meats out of Highland, Illinois. And although it has had no uh, none of our trimming, you can tell it's a really nice cut of meat right here. 
Uh, a lot of stores, they try to sell you a bunch of fat cap, right? That helps drive up the weight. This is really well trimmed as it is, but Chris, you're gonna show us kind of step-by-step step how we move through the uh, Estate Cook-Off Association event from the beginning trim, and that's what we're gonna pick up right now. Yeah, so what we usually like, we look for is, is a spinalis, which is your top section here. This is where your judges are going to eat from. Um, you look for a well-marbled, well-defined spinalis. This section down here, if you look at a steak, when you turn it in, you always turn it in with the spinalis towards you. That's where the judges will eat from. So because of that, what you're looking for then is what's called the appearance side. This will be the loin end. So what they'll be doing is they'll cut this steak in half, they slide it apart. That's what they'll look at for your appearance. That's what they taste. But this has a really good spinalis on it. This is about at its peak about an inch inch wide. Yeah, it has a great spinalis. This is actually a tri hardware. So this comes from one of the, the first three or four steaks. Um, you have this little extra muscle. This is kind of the very end of it. Sometimes they're bigger, quarter size. Um, but this is a, I mean, for a steak competition, this would be a very good looking steak. So this is something you, you picked in the lottery, mm -hmm. and now you get it back to your, your grilling station. What's next? So next is to trim it up. Um, you have to remember, judges only take a bite about the size of their thumbnail. That's all they get. So you have to make sure that there are five of those bites, but you don't want any of them to include fat. That's a bad bite. Yeah, it's right. so good. Uh, and and ribeye fat is delicious unless you're in a competition, the idea is to get it out. So a couple of things that we look at, again, back to the appearance, when you do this, if you put your hand over here, you're gonna see what they're gonna see, right? We got fat here, we got the tail here, we were talking about earlier. Um, sometimes, depending on what the appearance will look like, you can leave the tail, take the tail. Um, so what I would end up doing is I come through here, and there's a fat seam right in there. So you can go right up this side. Now, I know people are watching this thinking it's sacrilege that we're cutting up this ribeye like this. For competition, it's about the appearance. So you have to make it look like a perfect steak. And I think just like competition barbecue, just like the things that you're doing on that circuit, it's not necessarily the same things, the same steps and processes you would find if you were doing it in your own backyard or even in a restaurant type setting. But like you said, we are competing here. And like any other competition, sometimes victory is determined by inches and not yards. I've, I've, I've won and lost a comp by one tenth of a point. If that little bit of difference, that little bit of flavor extra would have put me over the top, I could win more. And winning isn't just about pride, although there's some of it there. There's also some money on the line when you win these competitions. Yeah, I mean, they, they pay $1,000 for first place. A lot of events now pay the top 10. If you're 11, you just missed out on the money and you don't get to say you're in the top 10. So there, there's a lot that goes into this pride-wise. It's, it's a competition. We're not in it to be mediocre. We're in it to win. Well said, well said. So we're, we're, we got the tail, the tail, that's what you called that, right? Trimmed off. Yep, tail came off. Um, what I like to do is I'm trying to make it look like a ribeye. You don't want your steak to look like a baseball or a softball. Right, that looks more like a round steak almost. Right, right. There, there's no cow that looks like that. So you want your ribeye to look like a ribeye. So again, we'll take that little bit of fat right off the top. And also what I'm doing here while getting that fat out, is I'm rounding off the steak itself so it doesn't have that point that you were looking at. So we'll take that off of there. So now when you put this together, and this is constantly what I'm doing is I'm shaping this thing to think, okay, how does this look? You know, we'll look at both sides of it. So now you can see more of that, that try hard yeah, there. Exactly, it's a much bigger portion of the muscle so, just having flipped it over. So when you put this in the box during turn-ins, they will not move it. Whatever you put in the front of the box is what they're going to taste from. So knowing that, I'm gonna take a little of this fat off of here, because fat, rub does not stick to fat. When you put it on the grill, this and this is going to expand because of the heat, 
and you're going to see that sticking out. So I'll take a little bit of that off just to kind of even it up. And again, the judges aren't eating from this side of the steak, so it's truly all about appearance. All about appearance. That's exactly what it ends up doing. And then you'll see you got a little fat down the side. Now sometimes, because this is on the spinalis, I'm taking it off. But if this were down here on the bottom and it was just kind of a, a layer around the outside, I'd leave it. Because um, eventually you're going to cut this thing so small that it's no longer, <laughs> you no longer have any appearance. There's going to be no bites for the judges, right. right? So, you know, normally I would cut that. I would take that off. I actually have a pair of like surgical scissors so that I can run along the edge. So you're like literally that. doing like surgery to this steak. Steak, steak surgery. Okay. Yeah. Sounds delicious, by the it, way. It's going to be good. Uh, but, you know, that's a ribeye there. So if I were to look at it being in a box, I would actually turn this this way. So that when they cut across the steak, this is the appearance. This is what they're going to eat from. So it leaves the majority of the spinalis for them to snack on. Okay, since you have your gloves on, can you hold that up for yeah. a camera and everyone watching at home so they can kind of see what it looks like now that it's been fully trimmed? So we got a little bit. Like I said, I would remove this section here and we'd get, get some of this fat cleaned up. For today's purposes, you can see the marbling. So when I would turn this in, turn it in this way, that bottom half's what you eat from, top half's what you look at. This is the side you want to make pretty. So yeah, it'll be a fantastic steak. All right, so we got it all trimmed up. What's next? So really what we do, it, tenderness is part of your score. The question is, do you hit it with a tenderizer? Do you hit it with a, a marinade? Um, do you leave it as is? Sometimes I've gotten steaks that you can see the tenderness in here. You just leave it. Um, so today we're just going to let this ride and we'll get an idea of what it's like um, when it's cooked just like that. Now, if you're talking about seeing the tenderness, I mean, I'm almost inclined to label you like a steak whisperer of sorts. Uh, it's like I mean, speaking to you, right? If you look, and actually I can show the camera. So you can see in this one, you can actually see how tender it is. Now, this doesn't matter because this is the appearance side, but you can actually see the tenderness in the meat. You can see the grains being exposed. You don't have that as much up here. So you could hit this with a tenderizer so that it kind of it releases it a little bit. Um, and then same on the other side, you can start to see how tender it is. And we've selected steaks that have been that tender. We didn't have to hit them with a tenderizer at all. So um, the idea now, you can use string, you can use pens, you can use nothing. Um, it's all up to the individual person. If they want to take butcher twine and twine this, it'll help keep it shape. Um, you know, something as simple as there's fat up here, right? Just a little trimming of the fat there to keep everything even. Um, I could, we could sit here and trim on this thing all day long. There has to be a point where you say it's, it's, good, it's good, right? Because I don't want to take anything else off of it. Um, so usually what I'll do is I'll hit it with a little binder, maybe um, some Worcestershire sauce, something like that. Just kind of put a few drops on, clean it up, and then we'll throw some rubs on it. So today we're going to change this up a little bit. Yeah, we talked about like layering flavors earlier in the podcast. You said you like to start with a nice salt, pepper, garlic base. And we introduced a couple of different rubs that have that base already included within the rub itself. So what are you using today? So I'm going to, as a binder, I'm going to hit it with just a little bit of duck fat, get the rub to stick. Um, our salt, pepper, garlic blend that we're going to do today is um, John Lindsay all queued up steak shake is what we're going to go with this is going to be our base layer and then we're going to go over the top with our savory herby top gun rub um, this will make for a fantastic steak yeah and you recently won a competition using that new rub yeah yep. yep it's been amazing ever since it came out so we'll just hit a little duck fat on it Again, this really comes down to people getting comfortable with the cook process. Um, when you get comfortable, you know, I went to um, Iowa, I think it was, or Springfield, Missouri, and I just didn't feel comfortable in the process. And then your consistency gets out of whack and, you know, then you just don't cook as well. So this is a way, and, and practice is everything. That's the hard part, right? Practicing yeah. cooking steaks. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if I have to eat a steak. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Terrible part of the job, I'm sure. So I'll come over the top. Come over the 
top, you know, top Gun run. And like, so for everyone who's listening or maybe watching at home, Chris, can you share with us? I mean, that looks like a lot of seasoning to me. Do you have a, a method or is it just an eyeball of what's the right amount? Um, it's, it's an eyeball, but you have to remember again, just like in barbecue, judges take one bite. It's difficult to really over season something. Uh, if you lay more off of the salt, then you can go into more flavors like this and it works out better. So we'll, and normally I'll do this an hour before I cook it and let those rubs really sweat in. Mm -hmm. uh, but because this is TV, we don't have time. Right. Well, live too, I think. Live, uh, yeah. T Bone over there is running Instagram or Facebook Live as we kind of record for our greater podcast. So, what I was talking about earlier was getting some of that flavoring on the end. Right on the spinalis, right where they're going to bite in. Yep. So, we'll run across the top just like this. And then we'll come over here. And I'll hit this guy with a little, little fat. Can't go wrong with duck fat. A little more John Lindsay's on the other side. Consistency. And you'll see we put about the same amount layer on each side. And then what I want to make sure I do is for a consistent color, make sure we get that all settled in there. Well, while he's seasoning that, I just want to say that looks absolutely tremendous. But what smells tremendous is we're here at Old Herald Distillery and they are brewing some fresh beer downstairs. downstairs now, yeah. I'm really getting hit with those, man, tasty, yeasty brewing smells. Are you yeah, picking that I, up? I get the hops. Yeah, yeah absolutely, really man. So anyway, this is looking good. It's smelling great in here. It's not the steak yet. But uh, so, next, now that we got this season, what do we do next? Well, now we got to check our grill grates came in now we're running this on a gas grill today um, you can run charcoal you can run lump briquettes and actually the cool part about the SCA is any heat source is available sous vide microwave whatever you want to do wow I wouldn't microwave it no it, it seems like a yeah, bad idea yeah. but it's there but it's, it's there available if you need it right so we'll check our grill you're not gonna win the competition using that microwave though that is correct so usually you're looking anywhere 550 to 650. So what do you got there? Tell me more so about what is, you're using. Yeah, this is from Grill Grate. It's our infrared thermometer. Um, what I'm actually measuring is the top of the grill grate, not down in the valleys. Okay. Because down in the valley is going to be hotter than the top is. So if we look at it right now, 542. Okay. So we're real close. 550 to 650 is a good place to be. So we'll go ahead and set it on here. Now, uh, before you get started, I want to interrupt. Why are you using, I mean, I, I've seen these grill grates used in a lot of steak competitions. Chris, can you tell us why? So uh, grill grates are an anodized aluminum. They're taking the heat, and we can check this, of this grill, and they're making it centralized to that. Um, they reduce all your flare-ups. So if you're using charcoal, the holes that are inside these are so small that flames will not come up through it. Um, and the other thing it does is it gives you tremendous sear marks. Um, so you'll see when we put this steak on here and we go to flip it, you're going to see the actual sear marks in there. And that sear is where you get flake. Yeah, and, and you know those flare-ups too, um, especially on something a fatty cut like the ribeye, they can actually... Uh, uh, burn the exterior of the steak. Some of that fat trips down, creates more flare-ups, and then you're left with that burnt, bitter, charred, really bitter exterior. Yeah, it's an accurate taste. It does not taste good. Um, the idea is to get the sear marks in there and get it seared, but not overdone. Because the darker they get, the worse it gets. Um, so, the, And that's why you want to stick in that 550 to 650 range. You know, we do it for the grill marks, which is why we have it set up this way. You could easily, if you wanted it seared all over the outside, flip the grates over. You can do a full sear. It's a very cool product. It gives a great crunch to the outside and a great flavor coming off of those grill grates. Okay, so we get it trimmed, we get it seasoned, we get the grill smoking hot, right? 550 to 650. Yep. Steak. I'm ready. I'm ready Let's to see what happens. I'm ready to eat the steak, but we gotta we gotta cook it first, I guess. Yeah. Well, now one of the things to understand is an SCA they want medium. I prefer my steaks medium rare. Um, some prefer them black and blue. That's great, but that's you're not cooking for yourself. So know that we're going to target a medium temperature today. 
135 degrees to 142, somewhere in there is what you're looking for. And so are you using an instant read to get that thermometer, or are so, you really more or less going with the field test? No, nope. we are going with our, our trusty thermopen. Um, we only have like eight of these. Um, we use them from barbecue to steaks to at home. We use them everywhere. So. Uh, we will be using our thermopen to make sure that we get this right. Yeah, and that's just something I want to share with everyone at home. Even the best carpenters, if they only have a hammer, they're not going to go too far. So just like building a house, turning out a really great steak, a competition award-winning steak requires some tools in order to get the job done. Oh, absolutely. If you're using a, a normal kitchen, wait for it to rotate thermometer, it's going to take you a long time you're going to burn that steak up. You got to be instant read. And there's several models out there, but we found that the thermopens are the best for us. So we start with a, a great steak that you picked out. We seasoned it with some high quality seasonings, mm -hmm. building flavors. We used the grill grates to help promote that nice even heat, prevent flare ups. We're then measuring that with an infrared thermometer. So this, I'm just kind of walking the audience through all the recapping, all the steps and tools you've used to get us just to where we're at. And, and we haven't even put on the steak yet. No, no. And there, there's actually more. I mean, you know, today we don't have our butter. I like to do butter on every turn. Um, we don't. We have a, a, a spice grinder that we use that. The first time you flip it to make sure it covers up any bare spots. Uh, there, I mean, there's tool upon tool upon tool. Uh, now, for the guy that can walk in and just throw this on a grill and cook, good for him. But it's if like, you want to be consistent, you have to have the tools to do it. Unless you're steak Jesus, I think. Right. Yeah. Right. So let's try it. Let's do it. So I know you agreed to be the timer guy. I will be the timer guy, and uh, we already have it set. So what am I timing here? What am I looking so for? So we're going to do, we're actually going to do four turns. Four turns, okay. Um, about a minute and a half a piece. Yeah. And again, your timing, and we talked about practice stakes earlier. When you do that practice stake and you see how it's done, you may have to go a minute 40. You may have to go a minute 15. That's where you make your adjustments in the practice state to get to the tournament state. Well, I can see where you're winning these competitions. It's very clear to me that you've done a lot of research, eaten a lot of great tasting steaks, and really have this down almost to a science. Although, as you mentioned, there is some art to it as well. Well, we're about to find out. All right, let's do it, man. So we'll take our trusty steak. And as we were talking about earlier, we'll give it a little duck fat. So I hit start. Hit start. I want to make sure that it makes good contact with the entire thing. Now, normally we have a lid we put over this, which maintains heat. Um, we're gonna, we're just gonna give it a go. And it's a great time to grab yeah. a cold one, perhaps your favorite fine aged brown spirit, old Harold. Have a drink. Yeah. I'm sure I there's must, no shortage of this during. I, the, must, I, I must admit, I was taught by the great. Johnny Joseph, that taught me, do not drink beer before you turn in. And I learned the hard way that he's right. Okay, well, earlier I called you a uh, steak whisperer, although I'm thinking steak Jesus has a pretty nice <laughs> ring to it. If you, don't, uh, <laughs> if you don't already have a few nicknames, we might have to add that one in the mix. Well, we'll see after the steak's We'll <laughs> see how it turns out. Yeah. All right. All right, Chris, you got about 34, 33 seconds left. And so so what's going to be the first flip that you go with here? Or what's the, the first move? So I actually cook mine. I flip them over every time. Some okay. guys will lift it and just turn it. But because your heat is going to vary, that'll actually vary where the, the pink line is, right? If you flip them over every time, then you're cooking both sides evenly. And you'll see when we cut into that, that you'll have an even line across. There. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's happened to me many times yep. uh, at home. So that's going to go off now. Yep. Now I need to restart, right? So we'll lift her up. And unfortunately, I don't have a grill brush today. Okay. I didn't bring one. Yeah, we're just doing this on the fly. So we're going to see if we can't roll her up here. 
So what you're trying to do is find another hot spot, spot on the grill, right? Because where you drop that down is inherently cooler now because it's had the steak cooking on it right. than the other parts of the Right, and normally what I'd want to do is go ahead and brush that out so that as it heats up while I'm taking my thermometer, every time I flip it, I would go in here and find the fire range spot that I wanted. Um, so we're, we're, we're kind of mad living, mad living, whatever you want to call sure. it, this process. But you can see nice straight grill marks. Um, and then we'll come back another minute and a half later. We're going to turn her back the other way. And that's where we're going to make our cross hatches. Yeah, now for everyone who's uh, watching this on live, I, I shared earlier on the podcast, the steak that we're cooking today uh, was actually for demonstration purposes only. We're just going to show it off. This was actually supposed to be Mike's dinner. So I just want to take my, I take a moment and thank Mike for sacrificing his meal for all of you guys at home. Thanks, Mike. It's like we said earlier, though. At least you know it'll be perfectly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> all right, brother. You got about 24, 23 seconds left it on the blows. timer. And so I noticed that's a really uh, big special. What's up with that, man? Well, a lot of guys, I mean, this is the grill grate special. It's meant to fit underneath. Very cool. So instead of stacking, you know, trying to fire underneath it, you can go underneath and lift. Yeah, I and see that it now. And you from tearing at the meat. Uh, you do for flip. Oh, there it is. All right, so now we're gonna come back. And uh, how about this corner? back this way that is warm so again you're back to your straight lines I know a lot of people ask uh, you know diamonds or squares it doesn't matter as long as they're consistent same size same color um, I prefer the diamonds but some guys will take their steak and they turn it sideways this way and then they turn it vertical and that's how they get squares on it doesn't matter either way. Yeah, and now I can see what this tool really does. I mean, from an, we talked earlier that appearance is one of the categories, right, that you're measured on in these steak uh, cook-off events. And man, this grill grate promotes some really sexy uh, sear marks on that thing. You know what's funny? Now that we're live, I screwed up. Oh no, what do you do, man? Well, we'll find out in a second, but I was already turned to the left. I think I got grill marks going the same way. Well, well, in fairness, yeah. on the presentation, they're only going to see one side, right? This is true. Well, thanks for your honesty. <laughs> We're coming well, down to the water, 27, 26, just to give you a heads up. I got the yeah, easy job. We're sitting here talking and drinking beer. <laughs> caught myself. And this is why you don't drink before this is the exactly tournament. exactly the reason. <laughs> yep. But the good news is I think we can make up for it. 10, 9, 8. We're going to launch SpaceX here in two, one. So, good. Yep. What did I tell you? There you go, man. I knew it by looking at it. Well, it's good to know, hey, even the pros uh, uh, make a mistake every once and again. It's humbling. No, it, it happens. Right? Yeah. You get to talk in, you get, you know. You've got the competitor next to you and they're talking about something and you just get distracted. Now, hopefully, when this thing comes off, I did this one correctly and I can save it. We'll see. In either event, I'm really looking forward to eating Mike's dinner. Yeah. <laughs> it's at least going to be fun. <laughs> All right, you got about one minute left. So this is actually the point with my trusty Thermapen yeah, I'm going to start looking. Yeah, what temperature are you, what internal temperature are you looking for? Here, anywhere between somewhere around 130 to 135. Um, you want to turn it in maybe between 135 and 145 um, is really what you're looking for. And I think. about 115 right now normally what i would have is a rack so i could raise this up and get it off of there it's kind of making itself an oven uh, and that's going to promote more even cooking relative to having it so close to the heat right. source right so 
know, the good news is if I really had to, we could flip it back over because this side's messed up. Right. <laughs> there it is. All right, so clear that out. Now, just because you've hit your time does not by any means mean that you hit your number. That's just your guide. Because if you look at the stake and you can come, remember, they cut it halfway across, right? 50%. Right in the middle. Yep. Um, and that's where your doneness gets done. So that's where you want to make sure you temp your stake. It's rising quick. And so you, you're taking the temperature in a couple of different spots. You're taking it in the center. Oh, yeah, that's what you said, actually, I, not I, the spinels. Right, you'll take it in the center, but I kind of run across the stake to see how each side is responding. So I'm done with this, right? Uh, Time actually, you? set that for a minute. And let's hold on to that just in case. We're gonna let it get close and we're gonna, we're gonna put it in here for a second while we talk and it rests. We'll see if we can't get it to that ideal temperature. And so how much does the steak rise in internal temperature after removing it from the heat? It could be up to eight, 10 degrees. Um, you know, it depends if you put it in aluminum foil or do you just put a, you know, a plate over the top, do you put it in your microwave? All of those are gonna have an environment where it's going to rise. Um, you know, did, when you pulled it off, did you set it on the table and let it stop cooking so it only rises two degrees? Or do you immediately seal it up and it just keeps rolling? Mm -hmm. And that's going to make a lot of difference in your steak. So, I'm going to call this good. The other thing is, you don't want to temp in a fat pocket. So, we're going to take this one. The first thing we're going to do is hope that we did this right. So let me bring a plate if you want to move that cutting board out of the way. And while you're doing that, I kind of want to talk. Uh, I saw there you. There it is. That looks pretty, man. Uh, and for everyone at home, take a look at that right there. That looks absolutely tremendous. Uh, great looking sear marks, as you mentioned. Um, while we're waiting for this to rest, and I should say, man, this is the hardest part of cooking anything for me. I'm a true fat kid at heart. And so when once the steak is done, it's on the plate. I'm ready to dig right in, but I know from enough experience, if uh, if you do that, you're gonna all those juices are just gonna run out the side. You're gonna end up with a little bit of a lake on your plate. Um, I saw you take the temperature a couple different times there, and I think that there's this cooking myth in the world. I'll get over here. Um, there's this cooking myth that if you put that instant read thermometer into your steak, you're gonna cause all the juices to run out. What do you feel about that? It's not, I mean, the, the needle on this is not big enough. The good thing about Thermapen is that temperature is being taken right there. So you're not making big gouges in the steak. Um, I, I mean, I don't know. I didn't see any juices coming No, out I didn't it. either. So No, we had Meathead Goldwyn on who kind of really talked about that any protein is really about 70% water. I think right. is the number that he said. And it's something we kind of talked about on the show. No, I've never seen it just rush right out as you mentioned but i often hear it talked about you can't hear it it's like an old uh well an old wives tale well it's it's brisket fat side up fat side down you know it's it's one of those theories do i soak wood chunks do i not i mean there's so many different theories that you know 50 percent of the people are right but we don't know which 50 percent right. yeah and you'll f spend more time uh, Googling the answer than you will actually cooking by the time it's all said and done. You know, a lot of barbecue and a lot of steaks and, and cooking itself is an experiment. Find out what works for you, what you like, unless you're cooking for judges, uh, and just do it that way. Because yeah. then it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I know uh, one of the things I hear all the time is know thy grill, know thy smoker. Not all grills, not all steaks are going to cook the same way. And so this is the first time you've cooked on this grill, and I think. That's where the grill grates especially come in handy because even though it's a new surface, you know you're getting that even heat distribution all the way across the grates and a very consistent plated product. Yeah, I mean the, the heat source is what's, you know, if, if I could throw a couple wood chips in there, I'd have to carry around this whole range with me and it'd, it'd be tough to travel the comps, but that wasn't a bad cook. No, it's great. I got my consistent heat, I got what I wanted. 
Uh, so we'll find out if we cooked it correctly. But let me take a look at So not a bad looking steak. Yep. Fortunately, I didn't have. Eh, we're close. You want to cut her open, see what happens? Let's take a look. So remember again, when you put this in the box, that the spinalis faces you. As you can yeah. see. Yep. Just like that. Yeah, so for at home, um, actually your spinalis starts here and runs this way. So I would actually put it in the box almost at an angle because I want them to cut across here, eat from here. Got it. Um, so that being said, let me throw on a quick glove. Yeah, we have a, you have a butcher's knife over there. I, I got a clean one right there. All right. Turns out these are probably all mediums. Yeah, a little tight. <laughs> Whatever, it is what it is. So, so 50%. The glove doesn't fit. Yeah. So you can see how tender that was. We'll you right could have cut that with a spoon, man. That was... That was pretty tender, yeah. So let's... I know. Just, yeah, see? We're a tad bit under. Now, that for me at home, that is fantastic. It's fantastic. But I think this is where we talked about in the podcast especially, getting the option to pick two steaks, right? And using that first for a practice so you would clean up, you know, again, it looks absolutely tremendous to me and I can't wait to eat Mike's <laughs> dinner <laughs> steak here. <laughs> He's back there giving us the finger guys. But, uh, but I get what you're saying. They want that perfectly cooked medium. Now, if we had rested this, say eight to 10 minutes, that temperature would have risen and it would have gotten there. Unfortunately, we threw a plate over the top, took it off and said, here, this is good. We want to try it? I think I have to. Where'd that knife go? Here we go. So really, again, judges are eating from spinalis. So. And this is all cutting they do when it's back in front of them in the box, right? You turn it in just like it was sitting on this plate. You don't cut it. You don't do anything. They do all that for you. So why don't you get yeah. into that? Fantastic tasting steak. Mm -hmm. And now I understand what you were talking about when you talked about, man, that's incredible. When you talked about the steak flavor layering, starting with the salt, pepper, uh, garlic, because that's where I'm getting strong notes that salt, pepper, garlic. But the other thing I'm hitting that's hitting my palate as I bite in is the savoriness. That's the word, savoriness. I know what savory is. But that Top Gun rub is a very herby, savory uh, type of spice. And that's right there is hitting my palate. Along start, start with the salty, end with the savory. It's that steakhouse flavor mm -hmm. that you get out of it. And again, you know, we were talking about how much you put on there. It looked like too much. You only took one bite. As a judge, that's all you would get. So it's not overly salty. It, it would be maybe if you ate the whole steak, right? Not overly salty. It's got the good savoriness, um, a little short on the doneness, so we get docked a point there. Um, but all in all, for a turn in steak that we just cooked on a gas grill, it's pretty good. It's excellent. So I want to talk about that that seasoning tip that you just threw out. Could be a little salty if you ate the steak end to end, but the the, the judge is getting one bite, mm -hmm. and then they're moving right on to the next bite. So essentially, they're comparing your steak almost to the bite that they had right before right. they ate your steak. And so that additional salt, that additional seasoning could help turn up the flavor profile, make those minute differences that are gonna have a big impact on the final score. Yeah, it makes an absolute, it, just a little minute, if, if we were a little less in salt and it became a little bland, they're gonna get you for that. If yeah. it's over salty, they're gonna get you for that. Um, we always play the game, cook for what 90% of the judges will like. Because there's always gonna be one or two that are like, yeah, two, I'm not a salt fan or I'm not a black pepper fan. But as long as you get the majority of them on your side, this is what you come out with. Well, man, this has been a, a, a very interesting experience. I've learned a lot. I personally can't wait to dig back into this steak. It looks and smells, like I said, it, absolutely incredible. So if someone wants to compete in a steak cook-off association event, how can they find those? Uh, you can actually look up uh, steakcookoffs.com. 
Um, it has all the rules, it has all the competitions. Um, it's got, if you want to be a, a, a promoter and you want to run one, it's all listed on the website. Um, and every single event has its own flyer. You can go through and choose. You can actually also sign up for events on the website. All you do that day is just show up. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's uh, really had a great time with you today. I know that you recently won one of these events, so I want to wish you, you know, continued success as you run up to the uh, World Champions mm -hmm. Championship, right? Yeah. Um, also, I just want to take a moment and say to everyone at home, if you're listening to this podcast, the greatest compliment you can pay to us is heading over to iTunes and writing us a review, preferably four or five stars. Also, this is an audio visual podcast, so you can find the visual component of this podcast. Watch Chris make this steak step by step on our website channel at Red Meat Lover. Uh, leave us a, a, a comment there. Also, if you like the other content you see, you guys know the drill. Hit that big thumbs up, like button, or even better, subscribe to our channel so you'll never miss an adventure as we introduce you guys to more experts like Chris and others from across the country as we continue to meet America. Meet America, not meet America. I've never been there. Meet America. America. So thanks for tuning in and we'll see you guys next week. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel at redmeatlover.com and learn more at meetamericapodcast.com. <laughs>